So I've got a bit of a bait and switch for you guys. Um, I didn't realize when I first prepared the abstract for the talk that this is going to be just about 20 minutes. So what I've done, originally we were going to be talking about, well, and also my partner Randall was here. He had a, uh, an emergency back home, so he wasn't able to make it. He sends his regards. <clears throat> what we were going to be talking about was the modern SOA. Um, what we're going to focus on is basically a set of SOA anti-patterns that we've seen out in the wild. I think everybody here probably knows what an anti-pattern is. If you don't, raise your hand. We're all good. Okay. Um, on that note, who here doesn't know what an SOA is? Got a couple. Okay. I'll get into that in a second. All right. So first of all, um, and my remote now doesn't seem to be working, so I'll just tap it. Uh, I don't want to switch it out this fast. So first of all, let's talk about who I am um, to give this a, a tiny bit of credibility. Um, my name is Tamar Sala, and I've got a history of working on applications that either were uh, a heavy SOA architecture um, or, quite honestly, should have been and I failed. <laughs> so I'm learning from both ends of the spectrum here. Um, I started out... Um, after, shortly after college, working uh, for the Southern California Earthquake Detection Center, which was basically a set of about 400 at the time sensors spread out across the Southern California area, um, each with a dedicated line coming in to a, um, a set of big iron sun boxes and a whole bunch of um, edge machines. And each, um, each one of those machines basically had a separate duty to be done um, in terms of processing all that information and coming back to the very, very end with is there an earthquake or is there not an earthquake? Now, of course, uh, detection, it told you like five minutes later, so it's like, oh, good, thank you very much. Because <laughs> I can feel everything shaking, it's all good. Um, when I was uh, with ThoughtBot over in Boston, um, I wrote the Shoulda uh, framework for testing, um, which I don't think like anybody uses anymore. Um, except for thought waters, uh, you keep going. Um, and uh, also the hop toad service, which is now Airbrake, um, which is used for catching exceptions. All right. Um, after that, uh, Chad Pytel and I co-authored the Rails Anti-Patterns book. So I'm sure you guys are seeing a theme pop up here. Um, while I was kind of independent contracting in San Francisco, and uh, then I became uh, VP of Engineering at Engine Yard. Uh, ran the development team over there, uh, some amazing developers, and, um, you know, pretty terrible code base. Uh, but one thing they did well is they were structuring things in terms of services and breaking things out well. So a lot of the, the do's and don'ts come from that experience as well. Uh, currently, I'm the co-founder of a consulting company in San Francisco called Thunderbolt Labs, hence the t-shirt. Um, and if you could uh, just imagine it <laughs> happening when this slide pops up, I'd, I'd really appreciate it. I didn't have time to Google for that. Um, right now, it's just my partner, Randall, and I. And we just hired a fellow named Brian Lyles. If you've heard the, the um, test all the fucking time. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, and hopefully, by the time I get back to San Francisco, we'll have a couple more people. So. Um, okay, so here's a quick outline of what I'm going to discuss. Again, I've only got 20 minutes, so I want to make sure that I, I hit everything. But first of all, I'm going to talk a bit about what the modern SOA looks like as opposed to uh, the kind of enterprise-y SOA that gave it such a, a, a bad name from like, what, 10 years ago, right? Uh, and then I'm going to go into some anti-patterns around uh, overall architecture for a service-oriented um, architecture. The, the, the testing anti-patterns, performance anti-patterns, and reliability anti-patterns. Okay, so first of all, what is the meaning of the modern SOA? Well, raise your hand if you've, if you've had to deal with a SOAP API in recent history. Okay, uh, it, it, that's a ton of you guys. I am so sorry. Hey, have you wanted to slit your throats? Like, because I did. I actually left blood in the bathroom. It was really bad. Um, soap is the hardest thing I've ever coded against. 
Um, and that's even when using really great libraries out of Ruby um, that try and make it more dynamic. It's just such a pain in the butt. Um, and, and luckily, developers recognize the fact that, yes, it gives you a lot of feature functionality that you can't get or that you don't easily get out of HTTP and JSON, but it's not, it's not worth it. So let's just forget that. Um, and let's also forget the concept of, of layers, which is how they used to, to sell um, service-oriented architectures back about 10 years ago. And, and just to make things clear, 10 years ago, SOAs were really just a marketing thing for IBM and Oracle to come into a, a, an enterprise company and sell you their consultants at absurd rates, right? Um, so they would have this huge diagram that, that looked like a, what my boss used to call architecture diagram, where they would have these um, you know, just big bubbles for no reason, um, and, and they would just put it you know, top to bottom, and they would say everything has to be um, layered, basically. Uh, the problem with this is that when you organize things like that, um, it's more like aspect-oriented programming than it is object-oriented programming. Um, and the fact of the matter is, uh, sorry, AOP people out there, uh, you guys lost. And so object-oriented programming has proven to be a very good way of structuring your stuff. Um, and at the end of the day, all that a good SOA architecture is, is another step in the progression of object-oriented programming. It's, it's all about the same principles being applied at larger and larger levels and the same principles being applied to separate uh, the various pieces of the system, um, whether it's methods or objects or up to separate processes, maybe on separate servers. It, it's all the same thing. <clears throat> Which means a lot of the object-oriented pro object programming techniques that you know and love can be applied to uh, service-oriented architectures. So things like single responsibility, um, doing only one thing and doing it well. Uh, every one of your services should adhere to this, right? Um, encapsulation, where you respect, you respect privacy. Uh, the same thing applies to services. Data abstraction, where you're, you're clear about what the data formats are moving back and forth. Um, loose coupling, especially. It's the whole reason for an SOA. Um, the only caveat, and, and this actually was was really hit home very well by the presentation just two before me, is that in a service-oriented architect architecture, you cannot think about performance uh, later. In, in most, most traditional like monolithic architectures, that's exactly how you approach it. There's some things you know to do ahead of time, like putting indexes on your database and things like that. But with a service-oriented architecture, because the message passing glue actually has to go over the internet, um, you're putting such a heavy tax on everything that happens inside your system that you really have to pay attention from the very beginning uh, that, that you architect things in a way where it's going to be highly performant because even the smallest amount of performance penalty um, quickly snowballs. <clears throat> All right, so let's uh, take a look at some of the anti-patterns that we have here. And this is one of my favorite photos. I, I, I love that one. So. Uh, maybe maybe you shouldn't uh, build a train station, um, I don't know, on a hill. Like, how did the train even get to that level? But, um, okay, first of all, let's look at architecture. Um, this is, in general, one of my pet peeves. I'm, I'm a very conservative developer because I started out as a systems administrator, and, and I kind of learned um, the burdens of having too many moving parts and the burdens of using uh, custom protocols and custom formats and exchanges and, and just in general the burden of trying to do too, too many things yourself when you could just use off-the-shelf technologies. And, and this, this I see happen far too often in service-oriented architectures. In fact, no offense to GitHub, um, when TB Dubs mentioned that he had written BERT, um, which is a, a custom protocol that GitHub use, uses currently internally for all production hits. Basically, I think it's used to manage the uh, is it the SSH processes? Anybody from GitHub? Yes? No? No? Okay, fine. Um, but it's now proven itself. Now I, I would potentially trust it because it's been used enough. Um, in general, though, if you find yourself going down the route of, 
well, you know, HTTP is not enough, it's too slow, or something like that. If you're not Google, then just stop it. Just, just sit down and, and don't, don't worry about that, because there's way better ways of optimizing your system and making sure that it stays maintainable. Um, another one that I see happen is when people are like, well, since we have an SOA, we can just basically grow things organically. Um, let's take any particular chunk and break it off of the monolithic application, and it doesn't really matter which one or where it is. Um, the problem is that that's looking at an SOA like a, uh, it's looking at an SOA as if it is a set of completely separate um, applications. And that's, that's not how you need to view it. You need to always be looking at it from an overall architecture point of view. Um, that's why a lot of companies have the, the role of architect, even though most of the time it's bullshit. Um, but you do need to be looking at this and saying, why, why do we need this service to be here and this one here? And what are the roles that these ones are doing? And let's not just throw up yet another service because then you get this, this huge spaghetti mess of, of, of crap. Um, similarly, uh, I see the, the Tower of Babel problem. So uh, a, a lot of times, a company will, will say, hey, let's, let's use an SOA for business reasons as opposed to technology reasons. That, that can work okay. Um, basically, they're saying uh, our teams are growing big enough that we need to split up the code bases so that each team can work separately from the others. And that's, that's not a, a, a bad way of dealing with things. But then they say, and also to give teams the freedom to explore various technologies and ways of doing things. And the fact of the matter is, um, when you've got an SOA and all of your services are built using different languages, different frameworks, um, and especially when they're using uh, different transport pro protocols or URL patterns, yeah, I'm sure that there's, there, I'm sure you can make that work, but why would you pay that tax, right? you should be using um, very consistent stuff. In fact, ideally, um, every one of these services, uh, this is a little bit controversial, but it's, it's fine, it's me. Um, every one of these services would be implemented using the same language and the same framework so that you could massively reuse parts of these services as gems or whatnot, right? Um, there are times when you'll want to take one of these services and you'll say, well, this is clearly a scaling bottleneck. <clears throat> and so we want to, I don't know, implement it in Node.js or something like that as, uh, as an example. Um, it's just you need to be very aware of the tax that you're paying when you do that. Um, the, that's going to get me to the hop toad thing, which is a really fun story, but I'm going to get to that later. Um, this is one of the the most prolific and disturbing anti-patterns that I see when I'm looking at a company who's built an SOA. And what we have here is a set of different services that are all accessing the same centralized database. Uh, now, this is really terrible for a variety of reasons. The most important reason being uh, data integrity, especially when you're dealing with the active record model um, as a pattern. The, the data integrity stuff goes up into the model layer. It's no longer at the database layer, um, which means every one of these services have to stay in sync with re regards to what they think consistent and valid data is. That's really hard to do. Um, secondly, especially if you're dealing with a, a SQL database, but this is true also of NoSQL stores, um, the, the schema management becomes a nightmare. Uh, which one of these services is responsible for running whatever migrations you have to run? And how do you make sure that the other services are down and then start after those migrations are finished, right? And then the final one is that, frankly, it's a scaling bottleneck, um, especially with the SQL stores where uh, scaling uh, horizontally is, is very difficult. Um, when you've got all of your, your entire system just hitting this one database, uh, the number of connections skyrockets, the number of activity on the database skyrockets. It, it's just, it's a nightmare all around. What should be happening <clears throat> is every one of these services should have ju the, just the data store they need um, to do their job and they communicate to other services for those stores. Now, a very similar anti-pattern um, 
is what I call Grand Central API, where yes, now we've taken this, this database and we put a service around it, that's good. We've gotten rid of a lot of the data integrity issues and we're no longer violating the object-oriented encapsulation problem, right? We're no longer go going behind somebody else's back to access data, but we do have super tight coupling at this point. And in general, it's a smell that you weren't really architecting your system. You were maybe extracting from a monolithic app and this is just how things ended up. Um, we had something like this um, at Engine Yard where we were building a system um, where this basically was the data store for all of the instances that run out in the cloud and every one of these services would eventually have to ping into this system to get its data and do its stuff. So you can imagine that now you're tightly coupled there and just like with, with regular software development, that's a problem, um, keeping the versions in check and everything like that. Um, the single point of failure, you're not gonna have nice, slowly degrading, uh, it's, not gonna, it's not gonna degrade gracefully when something goes down, especially the middle one. All right, <clears throat> let's talk about some of the testing anti-patterns. Um, you know, I'm, I'm huge on testing. Like, I, I spent a lot of time talking and thinking and writing about how to do good test-driven development. Um, my ideas change all the time, everybody's does. But one thing that really gets me every time is when I talk to somebody who's heavy into mocking. Who, who here, actually, raise your hands if you do test-driven development. Okay, not bad, it's about half. And who here thinks that they do uh, heavy mocking? Uh, who doesn't know what I mean by that? Okay, so um, heavy mocking is fine as long as you also surround it by integration tests. And this is done any regular application, right? Um, when, when you do heavy mocking, you're saying, um, I as an object, what, what's your name? What's your name? <laughs> Sorry. Sergey. Um, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I, I, <laughs> I'm saying I as an object, Tamer, know how Sergey's going to respond when I talk to him, right? And so I'm just gonna, I don't, I don't even wanna hear from you, I'm just gonna pretend that he answers the way I expect, right? And he's gonna do the same thing to me. And that's fine, as long as at least once in a while we actually have a conversation to make sure we speak the same language, right? Um, and that's basically the analogy for, for heavy mocking versus integration tests, it's not a versus, you need them both, right? Now, when you're talking about an SOA, especially when you have separate teams who are running each of these pieces, it's very tempting for them to say, okay, well, we're just gonna mock out the, uh, the other services and basically never do an end-to-end -end test. And, and you absolutely need that because you're adding so much complexity, so many gears in, in the way, um, especially at the network layer, that without end-to-end -end tests, um, you're just, you're screaming for a failure in production. Um, another one is boutique mocking. <clears throat> now what this is, is when a team hasn't really spent time thinking about how they're gonna glue their services together at every, at every level, not just when they're running in production, but also when you're developing them, you'll find that the teams start uh, putting their own mocks into place on every one of their services. Maybe using fake, uh, fake web, maybe using um, artifice, something else. Um, but they, they build each one of these by hand and it seems fine when you've only got two or three services. The more the services go up, the bigger the problem it is. <clears throat> and then you really hit problems when the services start changing and you have to go to each one of these applications and find the way that they mocked it and fix those mocks to match the new, servers, the new services API, right? Um, one of my developers at Engine Yard, uh, Andrew Delcom, he spoke in Japan about uh, the way that we do, or the way that they do this at Engine Yard. It's really beautiful. What it is is when I'm writing the service, I start by writing the client side gem that will consume that service. Then I write a test drive this service through the gem. So the gem is the only entry point into the service. I don't go behind its back and test drive it via HTTP, I do it through the gem. Then I have a mocked mode and an unmocked mode for that gem. 
I can turn the gem on to mocked mode, run those same tests. They don't hit the real service, they hit the mocked version of the service, and I've validated the fact that that gem works correctly. CI, continual integration, um, runs both mocked and unmocked all the time. So now, when I'm using that service, when I'm using Sergey's service, I've got the Sergey gem, I know that in my tests I can flip Sergey to mocked mode, and I can trust that it actually behaves, it speaks the same language that Sergey does, because he's validated that for me. It's a really beautiful pattern, it works really well. Um, and they, they use uh, Artifice uh, in order to hook the, uh, the mocked version up to the, the, the gem uh, at the rack level. It's, it's very interesting, you should Google it. Um, I could have put it here, but I'm lazy. <clears throat> so, so that's the, the, the solution to that anti-pattern. Um, okay, now let's look at some of the performance anti-patterns that we've seen. Uh, the biggest one is lack of caching. Uh, even adding memoization uh, at the, the, the simplest kind of caching possible is a huge win when you're dealing with SOAs. Like I said, in an SOA, you need to be aware of performance all the time. Um, there's a whole slew of other ways you can do caching, especially in a Rails application, for example. Um, DHH uh, wrote a couple of good blog posts recently about the new Basecamp and how they made it so snappy. Who here has used the new Basecamp? Okay. Is, is, is it just fast as shit, isn't it? I mean, it's just really incredible. It's like, it, it's actually flipping pages before I click. It's, it's really phenomenal. Um, <laughs> And they do this all through this, this consistent hierarchy of cache fragments um, sitting in this $20,000 memcache server um, with automatically, uh, they, don't have to, they don't have to mark anything to stale in the cache, it just automatically throws out the old ones and they're all done by timestamp and uses the touch thing and the associations. It's really a beautiful machine. Now, that's for a, a customer, like a, 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 a human-facing application where the, the fragments are HTML. But the same kind of techniques apply when you're talking about JSON uh, caching and that sort of thing. Um, and, and you can do caching at, at almost every layer. It's, it's really important and fundamental. It's the, you can do caching with uh, an SOA as fundamental as <coughs> database indexes on a regular application. Result takes as long as the, or barely longer than the longest running request response from the API on the back end. So if you're, doing, if you're doing a heavy SOA, you're doing lots of hits to various APIs in the back end, that's the way you have to do it. Um, Paul Dix had a library that I can never remember the name of, Ty Typhus? Typhus, yeah, uh, which basically did this same pattern. It was a little bit more um, involved because you had to explicitly say, these are the groups of requests that I want to do, launch them off, and then later I'll ask for them back. <clears throat> and also, as, as I understand it, I think, I think it might not be maintained anymore. I think he might have stopped using it. Um, but it's the same kind of thing. Now, the issue, of course, is that um, you have to do this uh, using threads, so, um, now you've got some issues with Rails and threads. I've been told that it's not such a bad thing anymore. Um, the library that most people use nowadays for doing futures is Celluloid. Um, I think he just announced that D-Cell is now um, production ready. D-Cell is a distributed Celluloid. Some interesting things you can do with that. Um, so it can run on multiple things. But basically Celluloid is just a, a actor con concurrency library uh, that wraps threads for Ruby. Um, and then, you know, since we're talking, say, uh, since we're talking about multi-threading, uh, JRuby and Rubinius immediately come into the conversation. All right. Um, this is the other huge one that we see in general. Um, is that it's kind of it's very related to the last one, but this is in particular we're talking about within a request response. Right. So, as the browser, when I access the client. Um, in, before the client responds with, with the response to the browser, it's doing like, what is this, four different API hits on the back end. Now your response times drop to about five seconds. Uh, that's very, very bad. <coughs> the solution to this, um, and this is uh, opportunistic. You can only do this sometimes, right? But the solution to this is to uh, background all of the requests that you need to do 
and it immediately resp respond back to the browser saying, um, here's as much as I can give you. Then as the responses come back from the API in the back end, you then update the browser through uh, web sockets or push pusher or whatever you're going to be using, and slowly the page builds up. Um, I believe this is basically the pattern that Facebook uses. Here's my hands waving, so please don't correct me on that. Um, we should also, um, sorry, I just, yeah, I wish to probably start moving to Q&A, just to warn you. Sorry, move faster? No, no, I'm, I think this is probably the, t uh, the time to move to the Q&A. Okay. <laughs> well, give me, I'll pop through the next one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All yeah, right. Don't worry. So, it's not, you know, get out of this. It's a, it's a, it's a reminder. Uh, another one is that uh, you should be using, uh, sorry about taking so long, but you should be using queues in order to amortize your traffic uh, in between APIs. This is the huge mistake I made with Hoptoad. Um, we, the exception catcher was happening in the monolithic Rails application and actually dropping all of the exceptions, every one of you motherfuckers crappy exceptions, into one big table. Uh, and I don't mean like big table, I mean like, it was a big table. Uh, 300 gigs. Um, so, okay, we have a whole section of reliability. Uh, let's see, chicken little clients. Basically, you need to expect that every one of your API calls is gonna fail, and you need to be able to, to respond gracefully with that. Um, and I'm gonna do a shout out to a fellow named James Gallick. Uh, who runs FetLife. You can look real quick at these numbers. They're incredibly impressive. He's written some libraries that handle uh, graceful degradation, including rollout and degrade. Very useful libraries, incredibly beautiful code. So take a look at those. Um, and the last one is Chaos Monkey. Who here has not heard of Chaos Monkey? Seriously, okay, it's the coolest thing in the world. Netflix decided that in order to build their SOA, um, reliably, they need to force all the engineers to accept failure. They actually have a process that runs out in the wild <coughs> in production and shuts down random resources. <laughs> it's very cool. Um, so anyways, that is it. Uh, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, do we have any questions? Nobody's going to call me out on anything. I love it. My question is about uh, authenticated services. Uh, um, do you have any experience with them, or uh, could you share some, some uh, recommendations when uh, your APIs really rely on one central place where you authenticate uh, all, uh, all the users or users of the clients? Yeah, user authentication is the place where <clears throat> most of the time I do see that's the place where I, I, you, you see that Grand Central Station pattern, and I don't know of a good way of getting out of it, frankly. So I, I'm afraid that I don't. Um, uh, yeah, I really don't. It, it just ends up being a pain point, and you just kind of accept it. The only, the only real solution, or not solution, but you mitigate it by making your SOA service as small, and, um, as, small as possible, and you don't <laughs> usually end up changing it very much. Again, think about object-oriented programming. The things that you're coupling to when they change, that's really the problem. Do we have time for any more questions? Um, yeah, I think there was one more question here, right? Okay. <laughs> any others? So what is wrong with aspect-oriented programming? <laughs> <laughs> uh, other than Tamara likes to be an asshole, not much. <laughs> uh, no, I think it, it's just that um, it, it, from, from my point of view, it's a harder paradigm to visualize. I'm a very visual thinker. Um, and so when I'm developing, like I'm, like, again, I'm, I'm super conservative. So I like to be the worst programmer I can um, because that means that I have to write code that even I can understand, if, if that makes sense. And for me, object-oriented development, um, it just immediately made sense. In fact, I, I realized when I learned it that I was already doing it when I was writing code in Turbo Pascal. Um, but without actually using objects, it was really ugly. Um, Aspect-oriented programming to me is just, it's just a harder paradigm to understand. Anything else? No, don't let him answer the question. I'm just kidding. <laughs> all right, all right, Miss Love. What do you, okay, so what do you the, have final, the final question, Miss Love. So, uh, just quickly, what do you recommend for um, learning more and about uh, gracefully handling, like, uh, 
errors, uh, failed services, and that. Because I feel, I personally, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm weak in this area. And you mentioned James Golick, right? And his work. <coughs> so. Yeah, I James Golick's work is really great. Um, I, I have to be honest. I, I haven't learned most of my stuff from books. I've learned it from the wild and from blog posts about people who run systems much larger than anything I've ever worked on. So I'm huge fans of, for example, uh, Etsy's blog and uh, Instapaper before they got bought, uh, <laughs> and uh, everything James Gallick writes about. Um, and they usually write about real world situations and how they tackle them. Now, sometimes it ends up being a little bit more of uh, marketing than informational, and I, that is a problem. Um, the other book that, that I've gotten about halfway through and I've been enjoying so far is uh, The Patterns of Enterprise Application Development. I think I'm saying that right? Yeah. Yeah, that, that Martin Fowler, that's a, that's a great book, but it's a little bit more enterprisey and less about, I think the, the second half is gonna get more into services. All right, is that, was that the last question? Yes, yeah, some, somebody really has to ask theirs. Burning question? You no? can probably also, they can probably, like, everybody can touch I'm not going right? to talk to anybody after this. No. So, <laughs> that's it. So that's everything it. is, yeah. All right, well, thank you very thank much. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you.